Let me see if this sounds familiar to you. You find a game, maybe it's Fire Emblem, maybe it's Persona, maybe it's God of War, Zelda, The Last of Us, The Fast of Us, take your pick, but you start playing said game. You make or get introduced to your character, you meet other characters, some who are charming, some who are not, some who are mysterious, and some who have great enthusiasm, and then you're thrown into the fray. You and your new crew encounter some conflict, folks build relationships, dialogue is gripping, and you find yourself genuinely caring about what happens to your new friends. You start choosing your words more carefully when interacting with your favorite characters, and may even reset the game if you feel you've offended them. Suddenly, there's kind of an artificial camaraderie that wasn't there before when you progress the plot. You might listen to music from said game while you're at work, whilst desperately trying to avoid spoilers. You might build the game into your everyday routine so you always have at least a little time to go be with your in-game squad, and you might catch yourself thinking about the game and its characters, or even missing them when you haven't had time to play for a few days. You may even fill in the blanks of the in-game everyday comings and goings of characters as you drift off to sleep at night. Maybe you've got a little headcanon going. And if you do any subset of these weird little things that I truly hope I'm not alone in admitting that I've done, then I would bet that when that game ends and hands you the happily ever after you so desperately craved, when your character and all your pals are gonna grow up, get married, have kids, potentially go into massive debt to one another, and your grand adventure draws to a big, booming, beautiful close that you feel completely and utterly empty. I bet that you feel lost in your own world. I bet that you feel confused that somehow even days later, you could paradoxically feel so sad about something that once caused you so much elation. And if I'm winning this bet and you've experienced that sensation before, then I'd really appreciate it if you were brave enough to share in the comments your story and the very moment that you had the thoughts. Hell yeah, let's do it again. I want to feel love. I want to feel lost. Sign me up for 50 more hours or something like that again, please. Post-game depression. Post-series depression. The show hole. The why can't I find something that makes me feel the way this game did syndrome. The I wish I could forget this game so I could re-experience it blind disorder. Pokemon heart hurt and soul sad. This phenomenon goes by quite a few names, but I think we're all familiar with the sensation of finishing a game that was especially remarkable to us, and then upon realizing the journey is over, spiraling into a very specific kind of sadness. A sadness that can leave us lying on our kitchen floor in a pile of tears, surrounded by empty ice cream cartons as we gaze up at the ceiling completely zoned out and try to confront questions like, Now what? How am I supposed to move on from such a moving and fulfilling story? Will I ever find another game that made me feel this way? Why was I in such a hurry to finish it? Why am I being so dramatic about this? I finally found my waifu and now I have to say goodbye forever? Who the hell am I supposed to talk to about this? That empty feeling comes from a few silly yet totally normal things your brain does, and we're going to dive into each one today, as well as what you can do to feel a little less empty when your happy ending is abruptly interrupted by a back to reality. By the end of this video, I'm hoping to give you a full understanding of just what the heck is happening to your poor little heart, and get it back in tip-top shape so you can go and get it broken again. Uh, I'm, I'm really doing this video for me because I'm about to finish my first ever run of Persona 5, and I don't think I can go back to normal. Uh, let's, let's talk about attachment. Quite a few psych studies over the years have investigated something peculiar that happens when we simulate a relationship with someone on screen or on paper, be it a character in a movie, a TV show, a game, or even a book. Horton and Wall originally coined the term parasocial interaction in 1956 to describe the feeling of connecting with an on-screen character, and it was later given a fresh coat of paint by Dr. David Giles in 2002, who called them parasocial relationships because they can strongly affect a viewer's emotions and behaviors in the long term. In fact, further research in 2008 and 2012 supports that they are associated with similar cognitive and emotional processes and have similarities with actual social relationships in terms of development. Although we all likely know these fictional characters are in fact, you know, fictional, our minds appear to treat interactions with them the same as we would non-fictional people around us. Which is why I desperately wish I could save scum in real life social interaction, because if I hurt someone's feelings in game or Edelgard does 
doesn't laugh at my jokes, I will absolutely be doing that. I don't care if it's real or not. I can't handle feeling like I've disappointed or offended a character in game, and apparently you guys can't either. But it's not just the fact that parasocial relationships closely mimic real life interaction that causes this attachment to these characters in the world they inhabit, it's also that these interactions appear to quell real life needs of belongingness and self esteem. A 2008 study from the University at Buffalo had participants write about a time they fought with someone close to them. The idea was to stir up the participants' belongingness need and temporarily reduce their self esteem. A bit rude, but it worked. Next, depending on their group, they would either write about a time they simply watched whatever happened to be on TV, or a time when they watched their favorite show. Those in the experimental group who wrote about their favorite program did not experience the drop in self esteem typically seen after writing about a fight. The relationship threat that is typically induced by recalling the conflict with a loved one did not take place when participants also thought about the parasocial relationships they have in their favorite show. It's almost as if the feelings aroused by thinking of the favorite characters buffered against the insult to self-esteem and the need for belongingness. This was even the case in a follow-up study performed where they controlled for the possibility that it was simply mood that was causing this effect. Parasocial relationships truly were remedying the blow to self-esteem, and this is a phenomenon known as social surrogacy, when feelings of belonging can be supplemented by relationships that are artificial or one-sided. Once again, the data supports that even though someone in your life may not know you or even truly exist, your mind may very well process that relationship as if it were real and appears to even reap some similar benefits to real world bonds. And keep in mind, this is all research based on television programming, not games. I would contend that attachment is even stronger in some games since oftentimes there is interaction you can actually have with characters other than simply viewing. Dialogue options, responsibility, camaraderie, customization, plot altering decisions, dates of varying levels of intimacy. Social surrogacy takes place when it's a passive viewer to character relationship, but when there is actual interaction, even if it is manufactured, I think it's a safe bet that the effect is likely every bit as, if not more, potent. And there is research to support this. A 2009 study suggests that many gamers experience a temporal shift in their self perceptions, and instead of purely their own motives, act as sort of a conglomeration of their own motivations and of the motivations of the character they're controlling. In essence, we often take up the mantle of the character we're embodying in the game, step into their shoes, and act out our portrayal of them. We pursue our own wishes, but those wishes may begin to bend themselves to support the narrative and our character's place in it. At least if you're pro-social, there is a study that suggests that those who are exceedingly anti-social will purposely behave in-game however they see fit, even if they're mean or difficult to other characters or players because they don't feel the same responsibility to preserve the narrative that pro-social players do. I'm talking to you, Trey, out here getting shamelessly filthy with your doctor. But the fact that there are so many people who play these games and feel obligated to be who the game and the plot makes them only supports how attached we can become to our in-game selves. Not to mention, in this study, an increased sense of control, identification, and responsibility for characters' well-being were significantly associated with enjoyment and appreciation of the title. Which is even more reason why it's often those games you so deeply savor that sting the most when the inevitable happens. Oh God, I'm not ready for this. Do you know how much it is torturing me to write about something depressing that I know full well I am about to experience? I just, I just want to give Sojiro a hug and then go play darts with my friends. Anyways, the end, the breakup, the credits roll, the... It's a terrible day for rain. But what do you mean? It's not raining. Yes, it is. So I've spent most of this video today explaining that our minds process these social interactions, roles, and relationships we experience in game pretty damn similarly to how our minds process them in real life. Now, you might think that I'm about to tell you we process the sudden loss of these bonds exactly the same, and that we experience real sorrow and real grief when our journey comes to a close. But my friend, if you're thinking you're clever, then you might want to reconsider. Because what I'm actually about to tell you is that you're absolutely right. A 2017 study examined people's reactions to the death of a character in Game of Thrones. 
Yes, you heard that right. Though I won't say what character, and it's not this one, whoever happens to be on screen when I edit this, you deserve to share the pain I felt unspoiled. The researchers analyzed over 1,000 tweets. Yes, again, it's, you, you heard that right. This is a real study. 93% of which fit into one of the five stages of the Kubler-Ross model, better known as the five stages of grief. And they found that over the course of 10 days after this character died on this episode's premiere, the reactions seemed to fit the typical Kubler-Ross model for timing, with depression peaking around the middle and acceptance steadily rising as time went on. People were legitimately going through it when this character was severed from the story, just like we all likely are when we are forced to say goodbye to all of our favorite characters at the conclusion of that special game. Similar levels of grief and distress were seen in studies reviewing online reactions when Kobe Bryant died, when a character on House was killed off, and when Friends aired its finale. The people on screen may not know you or even be real, but the pain of loss most certainly is. It also doesn't help that we often dramatically over-romanticize finishing a game. In his book Happier, psychologist Tal Ben-Shahar uses the term arrival fallacy to describe the false belief that once we achieve X, as soon as we do Y, or once we have finished Z, we will find happiness in that thing and oftentimes mistakenly overestimate how long or robust said happiness will be. Latching onto a goal like beating a game or finishing a story is enticing, and you might not be able to help yourself from binging it or hyping up how it will feel to finish it. But when we polish up that perception too much, it creates a slippery slope that we may very well bust our ass on. Are you listening, Daryl? So when that end comes and it isn't earth-shatteringly spectacular, it's just good, or maybe even bad, it only crushes your soul more now that you're dealing with that and the end of your journey as well as the parasocial relationships that have come with it, which leaves you here. Now, I know we've established that the end of a good thing can hurt, but let's try and end this video on a positive note. Let's talk about how you can remedy that emptiness, pull yourself back up, and feel love again. First of all, you should know that parasocial relationships are perfectly normal. It's a heavily studied topic and more than likely, we have all formed one at some point in our lives. They are, however, a double-edged sword because, as we have discussed, they can help temporarily pacify those feelings of loneliness and belongingness when necessary. The issue comes when we lean too heavily onto them and fall because, well, the game suddenly being over doesn't exactly let you down easy. Wrapping your identity and self-esteem too deeply in a game while tempting, and again, I get it, is only setting yourself up for another confidant ranking with the kitchen floor. A good way to keep yourself attached to reality is sort of having a tether to it, something to keep you grounded, something to be proud of in your life that isn't just going to inevitably cease and roll credits once you've gotten to a certain point. Marriage and family therapist Kevin Foss recommends this, as well as joining a book club or a fan club of the story or series, because it can help you reflect positively on the game whilst also connecting with others and developing new, real relationships. Which I think even if it's not joining a club per se, we all do at least to a certain extent after finishing a game. Community truly helps. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've laid around after finishing a game and just soaked up as many memes, discussion threads, and fan art as I could find to see what everyone else thought of the game. I absolutely adore the idea of tying your experience back to reality to take a piece of it back with you and enjoy slash debate it with other basket cases like yourself. Clinical psychologist Margaret Rutherford further advises that what can be soothing is to think or journal about how you were changed by that experience. How did you grow? Whether the book or series served as entertainment, learning, or both, its impact on you is yours to keep. Recognizing this can motivate you to seek other experiences, knowing full well that they will end, but knowing when they do, others will take their place. And I simply love that sentiment of being grateful for how the game changed you, how it molded you to be this moved by it, and how it's part of you going forward. Of course it hurts that it's over, but to me the fact that it did that only serves as proof that I spent my time on something genuinely extraordinary and memorable. In a way, I kind of want a game that's going to destroy me like that, which makes the heartbreak I'm sure is coming for me by the time this video actually goes up seem a whole hell of a lot less scary and even gets me pumped for what's next. But that's just my take, and maybe that helps you rethink your perspective just a bit. 
Not everyone has experienced post-game depression, if you even want to call it that, and even if you have felt it, it may not have been near as dramatic a picture as we've painted today. But if you have, or are, cliche as it is, don't be sad it's over. Be glad it happened. Know that the heartbreak doesn't last, and with a little bit of time, you'll be back on your feet and ready to throw yourself headfirst down another water slide of a game, gleefully headed towards the exact same destination that you're at. Talk to someone about what you've just played. Enjoy some restaurant quality memes, read or write an AU, draw some fan art, view some fan art, really view some fan art, talk about the game online, make a video essay about it, that always helps me, and be sure to tear up when you randomly hear your favorite music from the game on a playlist a few weeks later. Find a way to make the end of your journey feel less like an end and more like something you can take with you on your real life adventure. And if you're playing something you're especially enjoying for the first time, savor every moment. Remember, you'll never get another first playthrough of this, so, you know, take your time. Thank you very much for watching today, my fellow emotional wrecks. I hope that you got something out of this, and I would love to hear about those games that have struck the feels chord with you in the comments. Also, if you noticed this shirt in the video, yes, it is my shirt, and it is for sale. I released a trailer for it last weekend, so go check that out for the full scoop, but yeah, go buy my shirt. Link in the description. The folks at Bonfire have cooked up one hell of a good looking quality design, and I couldn't be happier with it. We've got hoodies and tank tops and colors and all kinds of stuff, but they're only available until May 8th, so go, go, go. As always, I'd like to send a heartfelt thank you to my very real, very non parasocial friends on Patreon, especially this month's featured patrons Tails Hunter, Alex Ocean, John Rivers, James. Quick Sparse, my boy, AP Rux, Dad Hawk, and Swift Illusion. Thank you as always for being here. Click the thing if you want to support me on Patreon, like the video, share the video, subscribe, and please buy my dang shirt. Wow, it feels weird to say that. Take care, guys, and have yourself a damn good one. Hey, now, I'm sorry, look, okay, here, it, this is Game Boy Color. <laughs> this isn't a real phone, the phone's doing the recording.